I guess one common mistake that, um, that I see producers making early on is is kind of cramming in too many ideas into one tune. It's um, it's really tempting when you're in the writing process to keep on layering stuff in, and that can, that can be a really good thing, just kind of getting ideas down, kind of the equivalent of brainstorming, basically, I guess. But then you have to learn how to take things out. Uh, someone once kind of I had likened it to poetry, the idea of taking out as much as you can like with the poem, you try and take out all the words that you don't need until you've got down to the kind of the absolute essence of what you're trying to say. And it's the same with music, I think, that the fewer elements that you can get in there that get across the point that you're trying to get across, the better. It's really easy to just keep on piling stuff in. And eventually that just kind of clouds things, I think. It, you can, if you can get to the point, it's always worth it. The kind of making that decision it, it is not straightforward. It's not easy. It's a learning process. It took me a long time to to get my head around, um, but it, I guess listening to other people's music, um, someone who you admire, try and kind of analyze how many elements they've got going on, listen to what's doing what, everything should kind of have its own space in the mix and all this kind of stuff. But essentially, it's just, it's a practice thing. It, it's, um, it's really easy to say and not that hard to explain, but it's harder to, to actually do, I think. As far as kind of taking a loop and turning it into a fully fledged finished piece of music, sometimes arrangements suggest themselves if you've got things that lead into things. Sometimes I know some people write intros, they just spend loads of time working on the intro and then they spend some time working on the drop and then they try and kind of glue everything together. For me, I tend to basically copy and paste something over six minutes. So take my 20 seconds, my 16 bars or whatever, copy and paste it, and then work, basically see what kind of combinations I can get out of those elements. You know, how does it sound if I drop all of the pads out? How does it sound if I kind of take the lead out, just drop down to kind of drums and bass? Um, and then from that, you can kind of get in uh, the, the intro or the breakdown, kind of sometimes that can come from elements. You might realize that you need other elements in there to make things make sense. Um, but in doing that, in kind of taking it out to six minutes, you've basically kind of forced yourself to take it beyond the 16 bar loop yeah. um, into something bigger. You have to be careful though that you don't just kind of leave it like that. You know, there's all kinds of um, finishing touches that you need to need to put to that kind of very basic structure to turn it into something a bit more special. But if you struggle to get beyond 16 bars, I, I find that's a kind of one way to approach it. Plugins, that I, I really like using at the moment that I find interesting are things that appro approach fairly basic concepts like distortion, but in a multiband way. So like there's a there's a multiband distortion unit from um, Fab the Fab Filter guys I think right. um, called Saturn, which allows you to split the, the your signal into into discrete bands, treat them completely differently, and you can kind of sweep the um, the crossovers. And it'd be interesting to see that for other types of other t other effects. So being able to have maybe kind of a, maybe flange because flange tends to do weird things with low end. Um, have kind of different flange on your high frequencies and then on your mid range saturation that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's something that people are starting to look at and starting to approach, but it's um yeah it's maybe a direction that that people c could uh, explore a bit more. So my production process tends to vary from track to track. It's kind of an answer that everybody gives. Yeah, it just depends on the day, but often it will start with with a sound or two, whether that's like a patch, like a keyboard sound or a bass sound, um, or maybe some beats. And then I just kind of just see what those things suggest. So often chords come fairly early on because I, I play piano and stuff. Um, chords are fairly early on in the process. Uh, and then it's just seeing what, what gets suggested. Um, when I've worked with vocals in the past, I, I've kind of gone about it a bit of a strange way and I'll write a really basic uh, backing track give that to the vocalist, write 
lyrics with the vocalist and melodies, record those, and then delete all of the music. So I'm just left with an acapella, and then let that acapella lead the music completely. So I, I like the idea of elements inspiring other elements, rather than just kind of, you get an element, and then you go through your sample library and try and find something that's kind of vaguely in tune or kind of could work. I like to get something that I think is is strong and then see where that kind of where that takes me. If I could choose one track that I'd love to put my name to like take credit for, have written, um, it'd probably be I think Timeless by Goldie. It's it's so epic. Um it's so emotional. It kind of it has that amazing kind of contrast of of really kind of deep emotion, kind of blissful elements, but really kind of dark. Like the the tension between the different sides of the track are incredible. And then when you think about kind of what it created, what came out of that, it, it was you know time the album was was. Um, for me at least was the album that kind of kicked off DMB and certainly brought it to a lot of the media's attention. Mm. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think, I think it'd be that. Um, best bit of music production advice that I've ever been given is you can't polish a turd, but you can roll it in glitter. Would you like to <laughs> elaborate? Um, uh, no, not really. No, I'll leave it at that. Okay, cool. <laughs> it, it mainly refers to remixing right, yeah. bad tracks that, um, <laughs> which you shouldn't really do anyway. But <laughs> it's kind of interesting the way that things have moved in the past how many years. It, for a long time, you had producers and you had DJs. You had musicians and you had DJs and there were a lot of people, certainly kind of inside drum and bass, that that came through and built really solid careers on the back of just being great DJs. Mm. And that almost never happens nowadays. It It's so hard for a DJ to break through without being a producer as well. Mm. And so you, you get a lot of people who want to be DJs, who are great DJs, but have to end up being producers too to, to get their name out there. At the same time, you get a lot of great musicians who are amazing producers, but have to DJ to kind of make the financial side of, of the business work because for a lot of people, the majority of the income comes from live shows rather than from record sales. So you've got this kind of weird situation where you've got great DJs who sometimes are fantastic producers as well, but sometimes aren't and great producers who kind of have to DJ and often, or sometimes, I should say sometimes, aren't great DJs either. So you kind of got almost the worst of both worlds, but great producers make great music and great DJs, you know, play great sets. So you still got those two elements in there. But I think in a lot of people's minds, the kind of lines between those are, are quite blurred. There's very few people that just make music and just or just DJ, which is a pity. I think it, I think it's um, I think DJing as an art form it is a very discrete set of skills, very separate from production. Obviously, there's stuff that you know comes across, but it requires a very different mindset and a different set of abilities. Um, but that said, DJing my DJing informs my production. Um, and I think I'd find it very hard to make dance music if I didn't have DJing experience as well. Seeing how things work, knowing how tunes can work in a set, how arrangements can, you know, can be functional, but also how arrangements can be interesting and what that can do for a DJ, how that can be inspiring as a DJ, um, has a, has an influence definitely. So much has changed with production software um, since I started making music. When I began, you know, you had to have big desks and lots of hardware, um, outboard and samplers and effects units and all this kind of stuff. And I love that. I love working with hardware. I love working with 
kind of things that you can get your hands on, but it's so expensive. Um, and the the increase in availability of software and the power of the software has done huge amounts for accessibility. There's kids nowadays, you know, 10 year olds who have been making music on computers for a few years. It's why you see people like Disclosure, you know, at the age of, I don't know, they're, they're like five or something, aren't they? Um, they come through and they smash it. And when I was their age, I was only just starting to learn you know, about mixing desks and, and mm. kind of sequencing on a computer, um, on an Atari. Uh, so it, it's opened things up hugely. Um, there's always going to be dinosaurs that, that complain that it's, it's too easy, like mix down buttons and all this kind of mm. stuff. But at the end of the day, if you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what you're doing. There are people out there who will go into a studio and they'll be lucky and they'll come out with a, a good tune because they've got a couple of sample packs and they managed to kind of weld a few things together and they managed to EQ things in the right direction. But to be honest, if you don't have the ability, you're not going to be able to reproduce that, you know, over mm -hmm. another 10 tracks over the next couple of years. If you're lucky and you have a, a lucky accident, then yeah, music software can make it easy. But if you don't have the, the knowledge, then it's not going to happen. It is amazing, though, how much information is around nowadays compared to way back when, when I started just jumping on the internet and, you know, searching for parallel compression. You can find YouTube tutorials that will teach you everything that you need to know and even maybe download kind of sample projects that will give you kind of working examples. But all of that just advances everything, you know, it just it means that people can learn things faster. It kind of um, it yeah, it just makes everything more accessible, which which can only be a good thing. Yeah. It does mean there's a lot of people making music, which is tough um, for everybody to get your head uh, above the crowd. But I don't know if if we find one, you know, incredible producer that gets access to um, to music production that wouldn't have had it without the advancements, then then it's worth it. The best BPM for me personally uh, is 174. That's my BPM of choice. Uh, some people go for 175. Occasionally, 178 has been known. 170 is kind of in my world is fairly laid back. Um, but uh, no, 174, I love it and. I always end up going back to it, but whenever I switch to kind of making house or something, 120, 126, all of a sudden I find that there's all these grooves that don't make sense at 174, don't make sense at 87, like a half speed of drum and bass, but they make perfect sense at 120. So whatever your favorite BPM is, don't forget to kind of mess around with it every now and then, switch it up.